Man, I feel energy in this room tonight. I just feel that God is up to something. Come on. He's up to something, and I know that he is wanting to do something tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to invite our speaker to the platform, uh, and I just want to I want to ask him a few questions. And um, Hope yeah. there's no math questions. Yeah. Okay, all right. This is about the quadratic uh, uh, equation. You remember that? I plead the fifth. <laughs> Amen. Hey, tell me uh, the climate. Uh, I know that he speaks. Uh, he's scheduled to speak to over 300 times this year in five different countries. And the Lord is using him and his wife in just an extraordinary way of of just sharing and teaching uh, about the Holy Spirit and helping people to understand. Uh, who he is in our lives and how he works, but what is the climate that you're sensing in in our churches and in those rallies and crusades that you are doing? What are you seeing God do as far as uh, just his spirit moving l at liberty? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's terrible. <laughs> no, no, I'm no, it's so exciting to see what God is doing just week in and week out. You know, it's really easy to turn on the news and see, you know, oh, it's a bummer, the, you know, world's going to, you know, Arkansas in a handbasket or whatever it is, but it's, it's, you know, honestly. Hope nobody's from Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But it, uh, seriously, I mean, God is moving by his spirit, and we have to allow him and give him place, and we're seeing just week after week just boatloads of people getting saved and healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we were a couple of weeks ago um, just on the New York-New Jersey line, right in that intense spot right at the Hudson River, and it's a bottleneck, and it's, I mean, it's pressure. Hundreds of people baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, it's just amazing to see what God is doing. And then to see what he's doing overseas, you know. I mean, you know, come on. There's always been wars and rumors of wars, and there's always trouble because they're people, right? right? But God loves people so much, and he wants to minister his grace. And we just, like people talk about Europe being so hard and difficult. We just saw um, this last summer we were in Amsterdam, which is one of the most, like, spiritually difficult cities, they say. And, and almost the Olympic Stadium was almost filled with people getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, you know. And it's just amazing to see what God is doing. I mean, yeah, there's darkness, but there's always been darkness. And there's no such thing as a flash dark, right? Like, you switch on and create darkness because right. light always overpowers it. Yeah. And uh, God is moving by his Spirit. So I just, I just want to be on the edge of what God is doing. And we're seeing it. God is so faithful. And he's doing it in this place. It's so fun to come to Living Free and see what God is already doing here, yeah. you know. And to be a part of that. When you think about darkness, you, you define darkness as just the absence of light. It really has no definition. Uh, darkness is just the absence of light. So when light is present, darkness is gone. And that's who God is in our lives. He is light. And when we step onto a dark scene or wherever we may find ourselves because of the light of Jesus inside of us, we bring the light with us. So darkness has to flee, church. So many times we're so fearful of those places, we're fearful of those moments, but yet we bring light to those places and God shines brightly and the gospel goes forward when we allow ourselves to communicate and live that gospel before him. What are some of the miraculous things that you have seen out of these crusades and, and meetings uh, that God has done? Can you share one or two that, yeah. I, I know you have one story about the man with uh, where you was hesitant to to call him out because he's the Holy Spirit stopped you. Can you share that story? I don't know what you're talking about. The, the, one, the one where you, you were afraid to, because uh, you're like, what if God doesn't do it? And I think he was, I think he was uh, lame. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, this happened a million times because none of us are really comfortable with God's supernatural ways. And he never leads you with like full documentation. He always leads you out of your comfort zone, yeah. you know. But honestly, as long as you're loving and caring and kind, it always goes well. But if you're like an arrogant and a jerk and doesn't go so well, that's <laughs> crash and burn. I've learned those lessons hard, my goodness. But, um, yeah, there's been so many. There's several occasions like that. I'm mean, one particular, I, and when you were talking about it, I was kind of, um, one particular one, uh, um, the Lord laid in my heart to, like, all the time while I'm preaching, I met this guy um, in the service actually in Osawatomie, Kansas, Osawatomie, Kansas, which is like a Kansas City suburb. It's like a terrible place of massacre. You know, it was a really bad, like a bad history in the town. And, um, during the service, during the first service, um, this guy who has a brand new Christian, um, he had ex it really opened up to the things of God and, and gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was really beautiful. And 
a couple services in, it's like a five-nighter or something like that. A couple services in, the Lord's like, I want you to go down and lay hands and pray for this guy. His name was Norm. And um, I, I wanted to pray for him, but I was, oh, man, I was so scared to death. Because, like, it's one thing to go, hey, the Lord is healing and just open up and receive. And it's another thing to kind of have a moment where there's a lot of scrutiny on it, you know, because, you know, we kind of take that on ourselves, even though it's not really ours. And so I, I, this is so terrible, but in my heart of hearts, I just, how can I arrange this circumstance to reduce the risk? Because I have a spiritual risk management department here. Do you have that too, you know? And so I'm like, okay, so I, I'm kind of like trying to wrestle with this. And I'm, I'm trying to preach at the same time, so it's probably not coming out very good, like usual. But I, I said, okay, hey, folks, I feel God's healing presence is here, which is true. Why don't we all stand up, close our eyes, and lift our hands and begin to pray out loud? Because I thought that will get everyone's eyes closed and it will create a noise cushion, you know. And it was really terrible. And I sneaked down like a mighty man of God, and I tapped Norm on the, he was sitting in the second row with his wife. He was, he had been uh, exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam and had taken his sight, and he had, I mean, a million things going wrong, but he had tremors, and he walked with two canes, and I mean, it was, and the, actually the night before, God had healed his walking, even though he still had to be led, and, um, um, and he had his canes hanging on the pulpit from the night before, kind of fun, but uh I went down and tapped him on the hands, and I said, hey, Norm, it's me, Tim. And he goes, yeah, what's taking you so long? Like 10 minutes ago, God laid in my heart, you were going to come down and pray for me, and I was going to be healed and see. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'm like, oh, great. So I prayed. I figured the moment was already gone by that point. You know, the error were already on the tires. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I prayed this kind of a real, you know, pathetic prayer. And, um, I mean, it really wasn't anything. I certainly didn't think anything was going to happen. And so I kind of amen, whatever. And. And he's, he has these thick glasses on, like a, like a retina surgery kind of glasses all wrapped around because his eyes were so discolored because he had had a heart event that had blown his retinas off and his eyes were kind of brown. And his wife said, I can't even look at him, whatever. And, um, you know, I, I wipe him out at night and I try not to look when I do him because it's just, it's scary, you know. And uh, I love him to pieces, but his eyes creep me out was her line to me. And, um, and so he's just standing there and I'm kind of like, people are still praying and seeking God, whatever. Nobody knows I'm down there. And I get ready to walk away, take my hand off his, and he puts his hand back, his other hand on top of mine, and kind of stops me. And he goes, I, I go, what? And he goes, well, it's just weird. And I said, why do you think it's weird? What's weird? Was it, you know? And he goes, well, I just had assumed from your voice that you were blonde haired and blue eyed, but you're obviously, back then it was brown hair and, and, and brown eyed. And I was like, what? And he goes, I can see you. And he reached up and he pinched the end of my nose and wiggled it like that took off his glasses and his eyes were perfect. And I mean, you know, only God can do those kind of things. And, um, you know, God is so faithful and it's so cool to see week after week people experiencing for God, not because of any personal gifting, because I can't help you, you know, but this is what God does. This is the New Testament message that God shares his power with his kingdom, with his people, and we all get to participate in it. So it's just so fun to see what God is I, doing. I, I wanted him to tell that story because it, it he didn't do it. It was just his willingness, as he talked about last night, to be the extension cord that the power of God flows through him to minister to a need that is in the room. That's it. And that's all of us. You know, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives inside of you. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to work through our lives, miracles happen. Miracles happen. And I think that's a word that many people are afraid of. They're afraid of miracles in the sense that it's on me, but it's not on you. It's on him. We're just a conduit for which he flows. And I'm just excited just to hear his stories of what God is doing, not what Tim is doing, but what God is doing has just been amazing to hear. And um, tell us a little bit how we can come alongside you and, and, and support you. If you haven't, don't have one of our prayer cards, this is the only way to know that you're going to heaven is to take one of our prayer cards with you <laughs> on the way out. If they, St. Peter will ask for this at the gate. No. Um, but if you'd remember us in prayer, tape us on your fridge and remember us in prayer. Um, it's so crazy because um, just driving miles in the last 30 years, we've done 1.4 million driving miles in RVs, which is another t thing on top of that. You add like the miracle of 1.4 million, but you add an RV on top of that, and then you know it's, it's like the children of Israel in the wilderness. But, um, but plus flying and all that stuff. And it, it's just been amazing to see week after week as people have prayed for us how God has always made a way. Um, it's not like... Holy Spirit Conference brought to you by Budweiser, the King of Beers, or anything like that. But it's just been as, as God's people have felt led to help. And if you feel led to contribute towards the ministry tonight, we're so thankful. Um, and if not, though, 
everything God does is free, so there's no obligation in that way. But if you feel led to help us um, on behalf of those that work with us both here and overseas, thank you for enabling us to fulfill the call of God in our lives. But I hope you'll all pray for us, remember us in prayer, and I can't wait to see what God does in the altars tonight. I am excited about that. I want to ask our ushers to come and wait upon us this evening. We have an opportunity to give and to invest in this ministry tonight. So whatever the Lord is laying on your heart to do, can we give in faith? Because anything without faith is just not right. You know, so we want to give in faith, knowing that what you are planting, what you are giving is going beyond just you giving, but it's going to continue the gospel around the world. So you have to give in faith. And I just want to challenge you to give in faith tonight. And watch what the Lord does, not only in the ministry, but also in your life. As you are faithful to give, God is going to, God is going to, God is going to take that, and He's going to, He, he is going to multiply that. I want to say, I don't want to say He's going to give you a brand new car, a brand new house. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we're putting seed in the ground, and with every seed we plant, there is also more that comes up. Why? So that we would be better off? No. So that we can continue to give again. That we can continue to steward what God gives us and know that as we plant, God allows us to harvest. And as we plant more, he allows us to harvest. So let's just seed tonight. I think everybody understands that, seeding. So let's just seed tonight and watch what God does as we plant in good soil and watch what God does not only in their ministry but in your life. So, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to give. Thank you, Lord, for all your provision in our life. Lord, we take from what you have given us, and Lord, we steward that because it all belongs to you. And Lord, whatever you lay on our heart to do, let us do that tonight, trusting you that as we seed into this ministry, we know that you are going to bless it as well as your blessings will be upon us. And we will let you choose, Lord, what those blessings are. Let us just simply be faithful with what you are doing. So thank you, God, for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, for helping us tonight. And I just want to personally thank uh, Tim and Rochelle uh, for being with us. I, we've had the privilege of spending some time with them uh, over these last couple of days and just around the table eating dinner and lunch and breakfast and then lunch and dinner and breakfast and snacks and coffee. Anybody hungry? <laughs> but uh, it's been good just to catch up with them. Uh, I have literally hadn't seen, well, I saw him at E4 last November, but before that, it's been like 30 years since we saw each other at college. We were, we were students together at Central Bible College, and uh, this reunion has been rich for me. It's been rich for Jenny, and we're so thankful uh, that you guys came back into our lives. And it's just an honor to host you and to have you here and to speak to our people and I'm just looking forward to what God does this evening. So would you give a warm welcome once again as Tim comes and shares the word of God tonight. Thanks, Pastor. I'm going to stand right here for a second. Can you put the picture of my family on the front screen real quick? So I'm going to invite, oh, I'm going to invite my wife to introduce our kids. I know I did this morning, but I'm going to tell them our special news. Yeah. You already heard this this morning, but you didn't hear this part. The two couples on either end are both expecting our first and our second grandchildren. So we are due in September and October. So we are very much looking forward to finally being grandparents. That's good enough? That's awesome. Yeah, I just, you know, kind of, it's our big exciting news. So we wanted her to be able to share it with you. Yeah, so funny because all these years we started traveling before we had kids in a Volkswagen van, you know, and then we started adding kids and turned into RVs because of just kind of, kind of family life. But uh, then all of a sudden they betray us and leave when they grow up. What's the big idea, you know? But now they're starting to produce some grandchildren. So I'm, you know, I'm excited about that. Hey, if you're interested uh, on the way out in the East Lobby, uh, if you're interested in some of the books and stuff, you can take advantage of them. Um, I mentioned some of the other ones already, but um, this little book, Want More, is super helpful on our subject tonight, Baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
And if you're brand new to this or maybe you have questions about it, this book is designed to help you walk through the scriptures and see it. Maybe you come from a Christian tradition where they didn't really talk much about the power of the spirit. Um, this will help. Also, if you're kind of a quiet loner and you're like, I don't know if I want to receive in front of other people, this is a great tool for you to kind of feel motivated to pray and press in and seek all by yourself. And it's a, a great, great resource. And then there's also, uh, there's all the other books out there. I won't go into all those, but but there'll be a blessing. And then we also have these uh, Holy Spirit digital teaching libraries I mentioned. Um, and picture of our family. One more time. I'm sorry. You guys are awesome. So the tall guy in the middle, he graduates um, Bible college here in like two weeks in Texas, but um, it was, good night, it was 22 years ago, that's right, is that right, 20, no, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, one of our missions trips to Indonesia, uh, doing uh, meetings there, when um, just the worst possible thing happened, he was briefly abducted there, and uh, on one of our trips, and, and uh, God worked such a miracle um, to get him back to us unharmed, and quick, and the, even the police were like, you know, they just don't mess up on this because it's such a, a big, un, terrible industry. How many know the devil is terrible, right? And uh, I mean, just, and, and so I was just thinking this afternoon, and we were talking with him this afternoon, and I was just like, man, this story could have been written so much different, but literally at the moment when he was being grabbed um, in Sumba, Indonesia on uh, August 4, uh, 2004, so I guess it was, yeah. Um, but I'm, trust me, I know the date. Um, but at the very moment, they were having an all-night prayer meeting at an Assemblies of God church in DeKalb, Illinois. Pastor Mike Massey's passed away now. And at the very moment that he was being grabbed, all of a sudden, well, a few minutes before that, a lady stood up and ran to the front and said, they, the Enlos, they're in trouble right now. I know it, my spirit. And 13 time zones in the wrong hemisphere around the world, uh, the church got on their face and began to pray for our family. And we had no idea until two weeks later we were at the church. And she came up and she opens up this big notebook and says, where were you at? And she mentioned that time in central time zone. And I kind of did the math. I'm like, you're not going to believe that, you know, what's going on. But I, I just wanted to encourage you, if you pray for us, um, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked on that, just thinking about you know, him graduating and everything. But if you're interested, this is just like, it's a media drive. It's got all kinds of stuff on the Holy Spirit. I actually tell the, the, we tell the whole story on that on one of the videos on here, Realms of Prayer. But there's all kinds of stuff on there, like how to be using the gifts of the Spirit, how to experience revelation gifts. Well, there's even a series on here to help you in your relationship with your mother-in-law called Freedom from Manipulation. For real, it's on there. And uh, it's true. But um, there's a special price if you want to grab everything, and all those proceeds go to help us get overseas. That's kind of how we raise, we raise money for that, so take advantage of it. All right, so um, I'm not going to teach long at you tonight, but let me just kind of give you a heads up. Um, we're going to pray at the end of the service. Is that okay? Now, ha think about it. In your own personal spiritual life, has prayer played a role in you receiving from God? Right? In fact, biblically, Prayer is the typical, usual avenue you walk on to receive from God. You call upon him, right? And we're just not talking about somebody praying for you, but we're talking about you praying. And I'll, I don't know about you. I kind of have spiritual attention deficit disorder, you know, and I start praying, and it's kind of awkward and clunky, and my mind wanders. Anybody else? Okay, me neither. I was just joking. Uh, no, but um, have you learned already that if you just kind of push yourself a little bit in it, that you get over that hump? And you really begin to meet with God. So I just want to remind you of that. Because at the end of this service, I believe God has something for every person in this room. He has a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit for each one of us if we'll just press in a little bit. It doesn't mean you got to stay here 10 hours or anything like that. But I want to ask you, when you go to prayer in just a few moments with me, will you intentionally give God your best effort and attention and, and, uh, and energy and prayer for just a few minutes. Will you do that? Will, like your best sacrifice before him in that way? Now, at the end of the service, I'm teaching on receiving spirit baptism. If you don't know what that is, you will in a moment. But if you are hungry to receive that beautiful gift from God, I have a special reserved place for you at the end of the service. We'll invite everyone to kind of come forward and pray and turn this room into a house of prayer. And I just want to reserve the front edge of the stage, right along here, along the steps and down the sides on either side. If you want to experience spirit baptism, when I say, hey, come on forward, I'm just letting you know right now up front. Come up forward, and, and you just touch your toes against the front edge of the stage. Um, we have installed electrodes all the way around. No, not really. But just to create a spot where, where you know, where our caring prayer partners, you guys have the best leaders in this church, 
And they'll know, and they'll come and gently lay a hand on your shoulder and just pray with you. No one's going to do any shenanigans or manipulation. How many know God doesn't need any of that, right? But they'll be able to pray with you gently, and, and you'll experience the most legit, authentic baptism in the Holy Spirit tonight. So tonight, if you want to receive that, you touch your toes against the stage. If you're up here like two feet back and your toes aren't against the stage, nobody is going to pray with you for that, and they won't know that's what's going on. But if you'll just come and touch your toes here, then we'll know. So the others, if you say, hey, I just need to download the update. I've already experienced spirit baptism, but I want to download the update. You stay a foot or two back, and, you know, no big deal. We'll just Someone will pray with you as well. Um, and God loves to multitask and supersize every order. Have you found that? Like a lot of times you're praying about one thing and he ends up doing a whole lot more. And so it's very common when people are praying to be baptized in the spirit that they accidentally get healed or set free from trauma or whatever. God loves to do that stuff. And we're going to experience his goodness together tonight. So I just wanted you to know up front what we're going to do so you're not surprised at the end. All right, sound like a plan? And the first people to the front, they not only get baptized in the spirit, but they also win a new car. It is a, um, a Chevy Traverse. It's white. It's parked right out here. Is that your car? It is. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, license plate number, yeah. Oh, back there, that's what I said. Yeah, okay, no, I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, well, let's dive in. Let's talk about um, the reality of spirit baptism. So this is so important for us um, to kind of think about and look at um, kind of where all this factors in. I'm not sure if it's the next slide. Is the next slide a graph or a grid-looking thing? Yeah, hit me with the next one real quick. Um, and is there another one? Hit me with the next one. The, uh, is, no, I thought I had another graph. That's okay. Go back to that one. That's fine. So these are the, the five major works of the Holy Spirit, and we see in the Scripture in our lives as Christians. How many are Christians? Okay, almost all of you. Good. Okay, so um, we have the personal side where God is working in us, and these works of the Spirit have kind of interior prepositions being used. They kind of happen in your inner being. So first of all, kind of chronologically, he convicts us of sin, John 16, 8. How many of you have sinned? Oh, just a few of you. I could tell the rest of you were special. Okay, so, but he convicts us of sin. He makes that a spiritual revelation before we're saved. But doesn't he also convict us of sin afterwards, you know? And that's a good thing. That's not a shamey, bad thing. It's a good thing. It's like God saying, you got a terminal disease, and there's a very simple cure of this, you know, and you're involved in it. Then the second, regeneration. This is Paul's fancy kind of nuanced word for salvation. It's kind of like a, kind of like a Hebrew-ish uh, kind of throwback. It's actually um, the word again, Genesis in the Greek. Genesis is the Hebrew word for beginnings, and it's like new creation, you know, he uses that. It's the word for salvation. And when we're saved, that is actually a work of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? The entire chapter of Romans 8 is all about that. We become brand new. And then immediately, number three happens, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. Everyone that is a Christian has the Holy Spirit living inside of them, whether they feel him or not. He lives inside of you. And there's lots of scripture on this one. Some of my favorites are like Romans 8, 9, where Paul just says, if the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you, you're not saved, you know. Or like 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 6, 19, our body, our carcass is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which has so much meaning. And he leads and guides and speaks to us and helps us in so many ways. And then the maturing work of the Spirit, you could also call it the sanctifying work of the Spirit if you want a fancy word for it. But it's just simply from the moment you're saved, God designs all of us to be in an upward growth plane of supernatural purity and holiness, becoming less like ourselves and more like God. And there's lots of scripture on this, but I like um, Galatians 5 because it kind of opposes the two things. In the beginning, like verse 16 and following, he goes, you know, if you want to live as a Christian, he's talking to Christians, you want to live a terrible life, then keep on living towards your own selfish ends. And then he gives the 12 works of the flesh, which are all the selfish character tribu or attributes that you don't like in other people that make you not want to be around them. And he's talking to Christians, right? But then he says, but if you live to the Spirit, your life is marked by these outcomes or this fruit. You know, and he gives the fruit of the Spirit there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, chocolate, self-control. And so you see all of those things helping you become more like Jesus. But the maturing work of the Spirit, these kind of happen to us. So when you get saved, and I get saved, we're like a donut. And God injects the chocolate cream filling of the Holy Spirit inside of our donut. How many are feeling spiritual all of a sudden, right? 
And just like the chocolate filling inside of a donut, unless, you know, they give you some clue on the outside, you would never know what's inside of that donut until you bit into it, which is not part of the metaphor. But it benefits the inside of the donut, right? When you and I are saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside, and he helps us in so many ways. When we say we feel the presence of God, that's what we're sensing. We're sensing the Holy Spirit within us resonating, like we talked about this morning. But then there's this ministry side of what God wants to do, and this is where he empowers us to do the mission of Jesus. He doesn't empower us for our own harebrained ideas. He only empowers his ideas. But he empowers us, and there's kind of two main things that happen in there. Um, he empowers our existing skills, what's naturally possible, like, for example, here, if you're a part of Living Free, uh, in the next coming weeks, uh, make sure you sign up for assisting with the Strawberry Festival, with the kids' ministry that's going on there. Because a lot of what God will lay on your heart to do is stuff you can already do. You can be nice to people. You can serve hot dogs. You can, you know, put the extension cord in the bounce house or whatever whatever needs to be done. And God will assist you. You know, Maybe you've gone on a missions trip to, you know, Tatooine and you helped build a church there or something like that for the Tuscan people. You know, whatever. You, you had one of those things going on. Well, you probably already had some building skills. And if not, you learn pretty quick. And it may not have felt supernatural, but the Holy Spirit will always assist you when you use your skills for the Lord. But kind of what we all want to experience is what is only supernaturally possible. And that's where all the miraculous stuff lies and all the stuff that God wants to do. And that's for all of us. It's part of our Christian inheritance. And so the Bible gives us two kind of sub points under this empowering work of the Spirit. The first is baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is our subject tonight. That's when Jesus takes your donut that already has the chocolate filling of the Holy Spirit inside, and he dunks the whole thing in the chocolate glaze of the Holy Spirit on the outside. Right? And have you ever noticed if you've opened up a box of assorted donuts, the ones with the chocolate glaze on the outside naturally have already gotten all over the box and all over the other donuts, right? And that's exactly what he said. You're going to receive supernatural power when the Holy Spirit falls outwardly upon you, covers you and robes you, baptizes you. And then you're going to get all over everybody. Be my witnesses. Share your testimony. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, the city. Judea, the province that it's in. Samaria, the next province over with the people you don't like. And then the ends of the earth, you know. In other words, it's going to externalize the kingdom of God in ministry in your life. And then on top of spirit baptism, you also have what we talked about on Saturday night, the manifestation gifts of the spirit, where in addition, where spirit baptism is a kind of a generalized, powerful anointing, kind of Swiss army knife, the spiritual gifts are really unique and specific in anything that God wants in that moment. So there's all kinds of resources to do this ministry side, but you just have to kind of get to the spot where you're like, I want to do more for the Lord, but I need more help. Anybody need more help? So that's kind of what brings us to this. So would you join me in standing to your feet in honor of the reading of God's word? And let's just look at this real quick before we go to a season of prayer tonight. What we're going to read is Jesus has already died, risen again from the dead. He's getting ready to ascend to heaven, and he gives them the promise. He already, in John 20, already breathed the chocolate of the Holy Spirit inside of their donut, right? After he rose again from the dead, then someone could be fully saved, born again in this New Testament way. He breathed the Holy Spirit into them. They already had the Holy Spirit inside, but he promised he wanted to drench them, dunk them, baptize them, coat them, clothe them in the Holy Spirit's power for ministry. So we'll read that promise, and then we're going to read the first time it happened on the day of Pentecost in about the year AD 30. You know those stories. Let's read together big and bold. You ready? Okay, here we go. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised as I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Stop there just for a second. I'll go back. That's the donut one. You see it? You'll receive power in the Holy, and that word come upon you is outwardly upon you. It's exterior, coat you and robe you, baptize you, dunk you, and then the chocolate of the Holy Spirit will just naturally start coming off your life onto everybody around you, everywhere you go. People will experience that. You see it? It's really important to see that because that's Jesus' definition of what this does. Okay, now let's go and read the first time it happened. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, 
and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, we're going to stop our reading there, but honestly, this is just crossing the threshold of what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. God has a lifetime of anointing upgrades for each one of us so we can grow and learn his ways. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for all that you are. I'm so excited, Lord, to be in this great church. There's so much health here. And and I just pray, Lord Jesus, that the days ahead for living free would be marked with a higher water level of the spirits moving in such a way that it affects our communities and our families and even foreign soil, Lord, with a greater level of spirit-empowered ministry flowing from each one of us and then the corresponding fulfillment that comes from doing your work and trusting in you. And Jesus, I ask you tonight, I know it's your will, so it's kind of already done, but would you grant this room to be the easiest place on planet Earth for people to receive from you? Help us to receive from you tonight, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated if you like. Well, let's look at a couple things real quick, and, and then we'll dive in to the altar. So, uh, first of all, spirit baptism is a thing. Spirit baptism is a thing. You know, I, the word thing, my wife doesn't like the word thing, but, you know, it's like a Dr. Seuss word, thing one and thing two. But anyway, that's not, no relation. But, um, but spirit baptism is something. A lot of people say, well, you know, I never heard of that before. I, you know, I was raised in church my whole life. I never heard about it. Well, my grandmother never told me about it, you know. Well, my grandmother, she was holy. She was the godliest person I knew, and she wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. You mean to tell me my grandmother was terrible? Yes, she was the worst. No, no. Uh, but, uh, but for some reason, we try to weigh whether something is legitimate based on our own context and understanding. But that's kind of a faulty thing. We base reality and truth not on what we know, but what on the Bible says, Right? And so it's interesting. You see in the scriptures, there's an entire book of the Bible um, after the resurrection of Jesus showing Jesus fulfilling this promise and this becoming normal and institutionalized in the way Jesus leads his church. And whether or not we've heard about it or experienced it before, at the end of the day, we've got to bow the knee of our opinions at the word of God, right? Because that's the only place we're going to find truth. So spirit baptism happens in five major ways in the book of Acts. There's also a hidden one in there too. But Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, we read that. And then Acts chapter 8 with the Samaritans. It kind of tracks Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. It's also a geographical outline. But then Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus. Acts 10, the Gentile Pentecost, which is a big deal, and Acts 19, which kind of culminates because Acts 19, the church at Ephesus, when Paul gets there and prays for the converts of Apollos to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, again, they already had the chocolate of the Holy Spirit inside of their donut because Apollos had led them to the Lord. But then when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit coated them on the outside, fell outwardly upon them, and they were baptized in the Spirit, and that commences what is probably the biggest season of ministry in the Apostle Paul's life, his longest pastorate, his most successful ministry, one of the greatest uh, outpourings of God in the entire New Testament. And Ephesus would grow then out of that to become the second largest church on planet Earth outside of the church in Jerusalem and the most influential Gentile church. I mean, Ephesus is a big deal. Nine of the 27 New Testament books were written to Ephesus, from Ephesus, about Ephesus. I mean, you've read the Apostle Paul's letters. Like, you know, he takes a church at Corinth through the woodshed, man. He, like, puts them on parole, you know. But the church of Ephesus letter, that's, like, gooey, gushy stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something. And so this is a big deal. It kind of culminates with this massive outpouring of God taking place. So you see this book is devoted to the same spirit that came upon Jesus and his ministry and empowered him. Now after Jesus dies on the cross and raises again and breathes the spirit to live inside of his followers, now that same spirit is now coming upon his church, his people, to do the ministry. And it's just a beauty. This is a thing, and it's an important thing. Look at the next one. Let me just show you terminology. The term to baptize in or with the Holy Spirit is used six times in the Gospels and Acts, and it's always spoken to speak about what we saw, the events of the day of Pentecost. That language is never used for salvation. It's always used for this after salvation, empowering from God, so that we can do more of the mission of Jesus in our lives. And a lot of people go, well, you know, I'm, that's not my job. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a missionary. I'm not an evangelist, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm a, and you fill in the blank, whatever writes your paycheck. Well, it doesn't matter what your vocation is. 
if you're a Christian, God has already called you into the ministry, right? And, you know, whether or not you get a paycheck from it, that's just a part of healthy Christianity that you serve the Lord. And honestly, that's really the source of Christian joy and fulfillment is doing ministry. Because sometimes just serving Jesus alone, people don't like this, but sometimes it's not a source of joy. Jesus even said in this life you're going to have tribulation, you're going to be rejected, you're going to be, you know, on and on and on, persecuted. It happens, but the source of joy, biblically, nine times in the New Testament, the association is made um, that when we do ministry, there's a release of joy and fulfillment. Luke 9, Jesus sends out the 12. They come back, wow, filled with great joy having done ministry. Luke 10, he sends out the 70 others filled with great joy. And Jesus has to tell them to cool their jets even a little bit, right? But then the Bible says the next verse, that Jesus privately rejoiced to the Father. Thank you, Lord, that you've hidden these things, the power of God from the wise and intelligent, and reveal them to these babies, so to speak, because they were brand new, you know? I mean, you can even make Jesus happy in spite of what your mother-in-law says, right? And then, or, you know, what happens in heaven when one sinner repents? All of heaven rejoices. There's this connection of joy in doing ministry. And maybe if you've ever been a grumpy Christian, how many are sitting by a grumpy Christian right now? No, don't raise your hand. Um, but if, if, if you've ever been around a grumpy Christian, even when you've been by yourself, that's a good thing to ask. What ministry am I presently consistently involved in? But the reason why we don't do more ministry is because we believe in our inabilities more than we believe in God's power to help us do his ministry. So this is why we need this, and this is always connected with spirit baptism. So it's a thing. It's there. It's in the Bible, and there's a lot more, but I just want to be condensed tonight. But secondly, spirit baptism is a thing for you and a thing for me. Because it's one, one thing to say, ah, oh, it's okay, this is something. But it's another thing to say, this is something that I need in my life. Now, it may surprise you to know that spirit baptism isn't just talked about in Acts. In fact, it's first talked about in the Old Testament, way in the beginning of the Old Testament, the fourth book of the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 29, by Moses himself. Remember the prophet that looked a lot like Charlton Heston? And Moses, Numbers eleven twenty nine 29, says, it's my godly desire and revelation that in the future, all of God's people will be prophets, and he'll pour out his spirit upon all of them. Because that was back in the day when you had like, you know, pretty much one at a time or a handful glow-in-the-dark, you know, superpower people, and everybody else was, you know. Like, remember, Moses could go up the mountain of the Lord, and God would give him like notes on granite tablets, and his face would glow and all that stuff. But what would happen if any of the children of Israel would even touch the mountain while Moses was on it? You know, they meet Jehovah Nukem, the Lord that kills you, you know. I mean, it was a, like that kind of a separation. But prophetically, in the fourth book of the Bible, he says, in the future, all of God's people are going to be prophetically empowered. You'll be supernaturally empowered to say what God wants you to say, and the Spirit will come outwardly upon you. And then at the end of the Old Testament, Joel 2, you know, that in the last days, God will pour his Spirit out on all flesh. All believing flesh, sons and daughters, so young, male and woman, um, young and old, will dream dreams, have visions. So not just, you know, children and bond slave and free social class, men and women. Listen, if you're a Christian, God wants to pour his spirit out upon you. It's the promise of God. All of God's people will be prophets, Numbers 11. God will pour his spirit out on all believing flesh, Joel 2. And then Acts 1.8, Jesus told all believers, you and I included, you are going to receive an amplification of spiritual power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When he dunks your donut in the chocolate of the Spirit, you are going to have an amplification of spiritual power, but specifically for ministry. Every one of us. And then I love Acts 2.38 and 39 when Peter's now explaining what's happened. Remember that, his sermon? And he says, um, this promise is for all of you, but you have to first be saved. The only prerequisite to being baptized in the Spirit is that you're saved. How many have that one down? Right? You've given your life to Jesus? Doesn't mean you're perfect. Like a lot of people go, well, you know, I, I mean, I got problems. I mean, I'm a Christian. I believe, but I got problems. You know, one of the common things I hear from people is, well, you know, when I get like one area of my life straightened out, then I'll be ready to be baptized in the Spirit. Like one I hear a lot is like when I quit smoking, I'll get baptized in the Spirit. In fact, Ricky was saying that to me tonight. One, one day when I quit smoking, I can get baptized in the Spirit. No, I'm teasing. It was actually Jenny. But um, the, no, 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 no. But whatever it is, fill in the blank. Whatever you feel is your Achilles heel or you're in a battle. Well, when I get over my temper or when I, you know, whatever. Um, 
That's not the way this works. It's upside down. Receiving now will amplify the Spirit's power in your life and bring more overcoming power. A struggling believer needs the baptism of the Spirit even more urgently, right? Don't use that as an excuse to put it off. Use it as something to mash your accelerator pedal down to collide with God in this way. Spirit baptism is a thing, but it's a thing for you and for me. Whether you're the youngest child or the eldest senior in this room, God wants to amplify his ministry power in your life, amplifying both what, you know, you can already do, the natural stuff. He'll help even more with that but even more on the supernatural side, and you'll see his glory. And people go, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah, but when you are baptized in the Spirit, you have an encounter with God, and in that moment, you're learning. Out of your helplessness, you're drawing near God. I need more of your help. I need more of your power. And all of a sudden, he begins to move upon you with his Spirit, and he starts prompting you, and you start following those promptings and saying what he's guiding you to say. And in that whole moment that you're being baptized in the Spirit, He's showing you how you do it afterwards. When you're like, I know I need to minister. I know I need to talk to that person. I don't know what to say. All of a sudden, you begin to quietly draw near to God. And when you sense his spirit, you find that prompting. You begin to say what you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs. And you always, in the natural mind, you always kind of feel a little helpless and out there. But God always comes through because he's God, right? Oh, what if I make make a mistake? Ah, you won't make a mistake. He's going to help you. That's what he promises to do. And so this is a beautiful experience. It's not just a thing. It's not just a thing for you and I, but it, it's a thing where he's mentoring us and teaching us the whole time that we're praying to receive. He's actually showing us what to do with it afterwards. It's more than just a, a spiritual encounter, which it is, but it's a spiritual encounter that leads us to some conclusions that really teach us his ways. Let's look at the last one. Spirit baptism is um, something that be gives us more spiritual bravery. We used to say boldness, but the word boldness, you know, is like actually a variety of hot wing spice now, you know. Um, But really it's bravery and courage, isn't it? You know, some people are afraid that if the Holy Spirit empowers me, I'm going to become an obnoxious jerk. No, not unless you already were one, right? Uh, He doesn't make you offensive. He gives you bravery to do the things. Because how many times have you felt like, I need to talk to that person, I need to do this thing, but you talk yourself out of it because you realize, you know, your own abilities. But he gives you more spiritual courage and power. And also that connection and this experience you'll receive in just a moment where when his spirit comes upon you, you begin to catch those promptings. That's going to become very real and vivid for you. Um, you know, it starts with this new language, which is usually what weirds people out. But it's actually not weird once you experience it. But before you have any context on it, you're like, oh, that's crazy. But it's actually a sign to you. Because he doesn't make you speak in the supernatural language that comes with spirit baptism, confirming that. Instead, he prompts you to do so. And that's a big difference. God's not a bully. He doesn't make you do anything. He leads you. He's just the best parent. No wonder Jesus called it the promise from the Father because it's so parental. But he leads you. You're praying and you're seeking. And all of a sudden, when you become aware of God's presence, if you draw your attention to God's presence, all of a sudden, he'll begin just to throw some breadcrumbs in your trail of what to say. And in this private, personal moment of prayer, it will be the supernatural language of the Spirit that comes to you, whether it's one syllable or word or sound or whether it's a whole string. Of, it doesn't matter. One syllable is powerful and from God. It doesn't matter how much there is. It doesn't matter how much you're shaking. There's no voltage measurement statements about, you know, well, if someone, if they just speak one syllable in tongues, then it's a mild baptism. But if they rattle on like a, you know, uh, someone playing the spoons in Arkansas, sorry again for that reference, but if they, you know, well then, that, and if they're jumping up and down, there's, or if they're really emotional, it's more, there's no voltage difference. Spirit baptism is a uniform thing. You are being empowered by Jesus with more of his anointing. Um, if it's received quietly, it's just the same strength as if it's received gymnastically, you know, and a lot of times that's the way kind of we respond to God, no big deal, but this is a powerful thing, but it starts with this new language. Jesus said, Acts 1-8, you're going to receive this power when the Spirit comes upon you. But then Acts 2-4, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in a language they had never learned in a, in a private prayer meeting as the Spirit was giving them the utterance or the prompting. And remember, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you speak in that language. He only leads you to do so. And then Acts 2-14 is kind of cool because 2-4, the middle verse, that's in the private prayer meeting, Right? And then when people kind of caught on what's going on and kind of got noisy a little bit, drew some attention, then Peter stood up and he spoke to the crowd. 
You remember when he spoke to the crowd that he preached at them in tongues? No, he spoke to them in their known language, Aramaic, with kind of sort of a street Hebrew-ish kind of a thing going on, you know, every, what everybody spoke then. And it's really significant. I'm sure you saw this before, but it's really significant that it was Peter that was the spokesman. Why was that? Because at the arrest of Jesus, remember, he denied the Lord. And at, at the early part of Christ's trial there, the servant girl around a campfire denied him three times, you know. And now, once he was dunked in the chocolate of the Holy Spirit, he had an amplification of spiritual bravery and power. And it started 10 verses earlier, Acts 2, 4, when the Holy Spirit came upon him. And so the idea of this is that, you know, if you can trust God to guide you to speak in tongues in a private moment of prayer, how much more afterwards can you be sure he's going to guide your known language to speak to other people? Spirit baptism is actually not about speaking in tongues, though it comes with it as a sign confirming to you. It's actually about what Moses desired, that you would be prophetic and the Spirit would come upon you and you'd be able to say what God wants you to say to other people. And so, I mean, honestly, kind of the tragedy of the Spirit-filled church over the last several decades is that we have rooms full of people who can speak in tongues who never have it on their radar to speak to lost people around them. But Jesus doesn't baptize us in the Spirit merely so we can speak in that supernatural language. So it's beautiful, but that's a sign to you and I. That's the starting point that says, I've just experienced something that in my whole human experience, Christian experience, I've never experienced before, unprecedented. I know things are going to be different from this day forward. And if you're paying attention while this is taking place, you're finding that where the breadcrumbs flow and how to speak. And I've had this happen so many times. I mean, my own experience when I was 12 years old, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was always shy and hyperanalytical and kind of nerdy, still am. And, um, and, and thanks for not saying amen there. But um, you probably wanted to. But uh, it's just kind of, the, kind of the truth and always really aware of my own insecurities and frailties and all those things and inabilities. And after I was baptized in the Spirit, it was so revelatory to me because, honestly, when it happened for me, it wasn't like levitation and great balls of fire like the old hymn says. But it was very real and very powerful. I mean, I hear people going, oh, you know, I just, you know, it was like I was caught up to heaven and, you know, I saw, I began to hear Pink Floyd music and then heffalumps and woozles and, you know, whatever. And that's awesome when people have the, for me, it was kind of matter of fact. I mean, I really sensed God, but it was like all of a sudden when the presence of God was there, suddenly there was just kind of a prompting. And I wrestled with it for quite some time because I was like, that doesn't sound like anything. That sounds, you know, actually sound like a, a product or something or some strange city in a foreign town or something like that. It didn't sound like a language, but it's an unknown language. Paul would actually say later on, it's an unknown tongue, a language you don't know. And so your brain kind of goes, well, I'm not so sure. But he doesn't make you, but he gives you that prompting when the spirit is upon you so you can start connecting. Hey, when the spirit's upon me and these promptings begin to come, that's a huge sign for me. And then he guides you and gives you patiently those moments when the Spirit is upon you so you can start kind of vetting that prompting. And some people are so wide open, they just kind of naturally instantly receive. But for many people, it takes some process, which is really cool. In fact, some of you, maybe some of you are wired up to be so private and quiet, which is not a deficit. It's just your wiring. And you'll come and you'll pray tonight, and the Spirit will come upon you, and the water line will be raised. But for whatever reason, you're just kind of uncomfortable in becoming so vulnerable as to try to cooperate with that prompting with other people around and say words you've never said before with others around. That's no big deal. You just put that moment on pause. And then whenever you, maybe you do better with the Lord all by yourself. When you get alone with the Lord tonight or tomorrow morning or in your car on the way home, you say, Jesus, just pour your spirit right back upon me when it's just you and him. And in the privacy of that moment, you'll be able to be vulnerable and really experience that sign in a beautiful way. So, you know, it's as a Christian, you're pre-wired to be baptized in the spirit, like it or lump it. You know, he wants to do this. The answer is always yes. But you just have to kind of get in those spots where you can make yourself open to the Lord. So let me end with this. Go to the next one. So. There are two parts to every miraculous act of God in the Bible. Now, of course, God can do something like the creation of the world where he just does it, you know. But typically, there are two parts to every miracle. There's God's part, the part that he does, and there's the part that we do. And so, you know, there's like a, a, a usual and an unusual way God does things. The usual way is most of the time in the Bible. And then the unusual way, you know, uh, like in the margins. Like, for example, how do people hear the gospel usually? Not all at once. No. What are some of the ways people hear the gospel? Preaching, media, internet, books, radio, you know, whatever. 
typically on some level through a human messenger. How did Paul hear the gospel? Audible voice, bright light from heaven, you know. And we see it happening. I have great friends in the Muslim world. and I mean, you know, there's no law that can keep Jesus from revealing himself to people. But usually, God uses people to bring the miraculous message of the gospel, right? So the usual and unusual. So when we're praying to receive spirit baptism, we're pursuing the usual. And if the unusual happens, hey, cool, you know. But we're used pursuing the usual way. So look at the, some of the miracles of Jesus just real quick. Like, remember the feeding of the 5,000? Uh, that's one of the my, one of my very favorites, and not just because I like fish, but um, but they're there on the mountainside. Tabga is the area. You can go there today, kind of where they believe it happened. Big open field in Galilee, and and um, they're like Jesus. You really need to, you know, you kind of been long winded, and you really need to let these people go because Taco Bell's already closed, and they're going to be hungry on the way home, right? And Jesus says, "What? You feed them, right?" And they go, well, Lord, all we, you know, there's a kid over here. He's got like two and a half filet of fish Happy Meals, right? We have five loaves and two fish maybe. And, you know, that's not, it's like, you know, come on. We, you know, we don't have the resources. And Jesus goes, bring the resources you have here. And there's 12 apostles, right? He divides the five loaves and two fish. How much, if you... Five loaves, and they call them St. Peter's fish is probably what it was in the, from the Sea of Galilee when maybe fished like this. And five loaves, loaves of bread, and, and like probably smaller loaves, you know, wasn't like a wonder bread thing. And, and two little fish, you break those up into twelfths, put one twelfth in each basket. How much of that? I mean, it's not even a full, hardly a full fish at all. Like somebody's got like the eyes and the lips and some and the fin and one of theirs, you know. It's just little pieces. And five loaves, and maybe they had a, you know, Maybe a biscuit-sized piece of bread in each one. I don't know. Maybe not even. And he goes, okay, now pass it out. I mean, do you feel how inadequate they must have felt? The same way you and I feel when God's like, go talk to that. Well, Lord, I don't. But you take those five loaves and two fish. Jesus did his part, but he did it when they did their part. They began to pass it out. And the Bible never says that suddenly the basket was full. The Bible says that they passed out all that was needed. And then when it was over, how many baskets fulls were left? Twelve. Each one of their baskets had gone from crumbs. They fed everyone, and then it was full by the time they were done. Right? But it required them cooperating with Jesus even though they didn't fully understand. And that's what's going to happen in a moment. When you're up here praying, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's going to move upon you, not scary or weird. He's not going to make you do something weird or embarrass yourself. But he's going to move in such a way upon you that you're really going to sense God. You'll know it's him, trust me. And when he does, he's going to begin to prompt you to do something you've never done before. There'll be this urgency to speak will come from inside of you, and you'll know it's God because it's there, and your brain's going to go, you don't have enough information to move forward. Well, Lord, if you could just send it to me and send it through my uh, attorney, and I'll vet it and uh, send it in triplicate by FedEx. But he's just going to give you this inner urging. He may prompt you. I don't know how he'll prompt you. A lot of times he prompts people with a, a couple sounds or syllables or just the urgency to speak. However he prompts you, if you'll just begin to do your part then, Start passing out what he gives you. Begin to try to give yourself to God and follow that prompting. It starts kicking in right away. But most people are waiting because they're afraid they're going to get it wrong or do the wrong thing. They wait until God, like, puppets them, which he really doesn't do. So you have to follow those promptings. He's giving you a little more bravery, and you have to kind of follow through on that. Or what about, remember, um, the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus is not on the boat in this time, and all of a sudden they see this glowing figure walking towards them. This is actually the one time in the Greek Bible that the word ghost, as in creepy, disembodied, spooky thing, is used. Uh, it's never for Holy Spirit, but this is the time phantasma is actually used um, in the original Greek text. And they think he's a ghost walking on glowing, woo, you know, whatever. And, and they're scared to death, and Jesus hollers out. You remember what he says? Hey, don't be afraid. It's me. Or fear not, whatever, you know. Um, and... Who pipes up? You remember? Peter. What does he say? If it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you. And then I, I know right away, and I'll step away from the pulpit because I know this is it's probably, when we watch the, the tapes in heaven, I'm sure this is what happens. But I was like, oh, rats, why did I say that? You know, because, but Jesus goes, hey, Peter, it's me, come on. Now, up to that time in Peter's life, being raised in, on the Sea of Galilee, being a fisherman, I mean, how many tens of thousands of times had he gotten in and out of boats? And up to that time, every time except for once that he had gotten into a boat, he had already gotten out of it. 
And he will do that, but it was always at the shore, most likely, you know. And now it's at the sea, and it's dynamic. You know, it's not, the Bible does not say at that moment that it's a sea of glass. It's uh, kind of tumultuous. It's almost like maybe, I don't know, but maybe it's almost like Jesus is standing on what perceived to be a membrane. You know, it's dynamic under his feet, and he's walking, you know. And Peter's like, ah, rats. But the Bible says then Peter stepped out of the boat. Still, he didn't have the ability to do what God wanted him to do or didn't perceive it. But the moment his feet touched the surface of the water, that's when God's part kicked in, right? He didn't learn the skill and be oh, totally okay with walking on water, right? But he stepped, and the moment he stepped on the water, God did his part and held up Peter's feet. And then you know the story. He got freer, afraid and took his eyes off Jesus, and, and Jesus came through again, just like he always does in our lives. But it's the same way. There'll be God's part. He will begin to stir you. You will know the Holy Spirit's power is upon you. And some of you, honestly, will happen pretty quick. You'll be up here at the altar, toes against the altar, and all of a sudden, Lord, fill me with your spirit. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I know God is here. And all you have to do in that moment is do your best to draw all of your attention to the presence of God that's there. Don't overthink it. Like what I see people do a lot of times, they're praying, and they're like, Lord, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. And then when they sense the Holy Spirit upon them, they do what they're doing louder and faster. Because it's kind of exciting. Lord, I love you. Thank you. Fill me with your spirit. And they get stuck in these verbal boot loops, you know, of almost like a child playing the game where you try to keep the balloon from hitting the ground, you know, or spinning the plates or whatever it is. But the moment the Holy Spirit's power is upon you, he's not asking you to concentrate more or try harder. He, that's not where the prompting, the prompting doesn't come from your brain. It comes from the Holy Spirit to your spirit. So all you have to do is when the Holy Spirit is upon you is you just quiet down and you just draw all of your attention to God's presence, and all of a sudden, the breadcrumb trail will become clear for you. The prompting will be there. And all you have to do is just uh, take it right now. When the Holy Spirit moves upon me and he starts prompting me, I'm just going to say whatever he prompts me to say. I'm going to follow it. You're not going to make a mistake. It's not like you're praying to the devil or Mickey Mouse or Tom Brady or some other demonic character, right? Um, you're praying to Jesus, and this is his promise for you, right? It's not like, oh, the lucky ones will receive tonight. It's for every one of us. It's his promise to us because he wants to use us all in ministry. And the whole time while he's prompting you, again, he's teaching you that when you know you need to talk to that person or do that thing, what have you learned? You draw near quietly to God's presence. And when you sense him, that's when you quiet down because you never find the answer in your brain. I mean, your brain's not bad or terrible, you know, unless you're a Cowboys fan. But, uh, you, you know, it won't, won't, be, won't be that way. But instead, the prompting from the Holy Spirit comes from the inner moving of the Spirit inside of you. And he leads you in that way. And it's even if you're not like a touchy-feely person, tough. That's the way that God works. And you have the ability to do that and to follow his leading in those ways. And here's how it looks. Look at this last uh, statement. So here's how, here's how the steps work. And if um, some of the worship team wants to come back up, it would be awesome. And maybe, because I mentioned maybe someone playing the spoons. Could you do that? That would be awesome. Okay. So... Here's how this works. We get this from Acts 2, 10, and 19 where there's a lot of details on how they receive. Step number one, it's on you and I, the seeker. We have to choose to draw near. And normally prayer is how we draw near. It's a normal way we receive from God. So you, And prayer usually starts out, like I said, awkward and clunky. But if you'll just start praying, you know, Lord, I love you. And, th and just relax. Nothing weird is going to happen. You're not going to pass out and wet your pants or anything like that, right? I mean, Jesus is not here to embarrass you. He's here to embrace you and pour his spirit out upon you and make you more effective and more fulfilled in your life. And so it's not fearful and scary. It's not panicked. I hope I get it right. It's not like you're walking on a tightrope that's really easy to fall off of. This is a component of all that God has for you and your salvation inheritance. He's already said yes, you know. So you just begin to draw near. Take a deep breath and relax. There's no hurry. There's no struggle. There's no stress. You know, it's not like no race to whoever receives first gets a discount on their tithe or something. It's not like that, you know. We're just drawing near to him. And you'll find if you just relax and start drawing near to Jesus, it will become so second nature for you to receive this. That's something you have to start. And then secondly, you're going to discover because Jesus is going to pour out his spirit upon you. And honestly, this usually happens quicker than people expect. In fact, a lot of times it nearly happens immediately for people when they Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm hungry or whatever. All of a sudden, they just feel the Holy Spirit just washing over them. But that's when it's important to stop speaking. Pray like the house is on fire until you sense the Holy Spirit upon you. And then your job is not to continue to talk out of your intelligence and use the engine of your intelligence. 
Your job is to draw your attention to where you feel the Holy Spirit. That's where the promptings come from. And if you're a long-term seeker, that's usually what keeps people from finding that language as they try to stay intellectual all those moments. I mean, no joke. When the Spirit's upon you, just take a deep breath, open up, and draw near to God, and the language of the Spirit will just be there. It's intuitive. It's second nature. And so stop speaking from your intelligence and instead start speaking the promptings you sense while the presence of God is upon you. And your brain's going to give you every reason why you should. Oh, you're going to get it wrong. That sounds kooky. I don't know, you know. But he's going to guide you and lead you. And that's the way he does it in the Bible. You can read these facts in three chapters in the book of Acts, Acts 2, 10, and 19. That's the way he does. So we have good, solid ground. But again, it instructs us for tonight or tomorrow. You know, you guys have Piggly Wiggly here? We're not that poor. What is it? What is the grocery store around here? Oh, Food Lion. Okay, all right. So I do it had an animal in it. Um, uh, more majestic one than the pig. But, uh, you know, when you're at the food line, all of a sudden, God's like, go talk to that person over by the garbanzo beans, you know. Um, you know what to do. You quietly draw near to God when you sense his presence, and you listen, not in your, what should I say, but you listen out of God's presence, and he'll begin to guide you in what to do and what to say. That's how prophetic ministry works. So why don't you stand up with me? Take a stretch. You've been sitting there for a while. Reach out. We're not going to be here forever tonight. In fact, um, some of you will receive very quickly, and you can get home in time to eat a burrito and go to bed writhe in misery in your sleep, you know, for the burrito. But I want to ask you, if you just do something, would you close your eyes with me across this room? You know, the most important thing that can happen in your life spiritually is not spirit baptism. It's salvation. In fact, spirit baptism has no importance for you whatsoever if you've not yet given your life to Christ. Salvation is the single greatest, most important status setting family adoption signing papers that can happen in your life spiritually and I just want to give you the opportunity maybe someone in this room or someone watching online you've never given your life to Jesus this is the moment this is the moment and it's so easy on one level and so difficult on another it's easy because it's simply calling out to God and being honest but it's difficult because it requires great vulnerability repentance and faith those are the two ingredients for salvation according to the Apostle Paul repentance is saying God, I've got a sin problem, and it's so bad I need supernatural help, right? But the faith is saying, God, I believe you're the one that can help me. I believe who Jesus is. And tonight, if you're not living in a right relationship with God, but you want to make things right with him tonight, just wave your hand at me. I'm not going to embarrass you.